morning, everyone. Let's sing about our God. Let's praise his name. So why do you turn into wine? Why do you turn into wine? Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness. Into the darkness we shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Everything. 
about how worthy our God is of all blessing and honor and glory. Let's sing it together. Feel free as I sing the question this morning. You feel the world is broken. As we sing through these questions, feel free to, to sing out we do, especially the end. These words. Father. 
As we go into a time of prayer this morning, uh, we want to be thinking about our missionaries um, in the United States, uh, in our community, and in abroad um, as we go into this missions month. And uh, we are going to take a few moments for prayer here in just um, a few minutes. But before we do, Aaron is going to talk about our kingdom commitment, our missions, um, and about a little bit about how we support and who we support in that area. And then we're going to get into prayer. May is Missions Month here at the Christian Church of Estes Park, and we take a month each year to focus in on our missions, kind of look at what we are doing for missions and how we are investing in the mission that God has for us. And so each week this month, we'll be talking about different aspect of that. And today we're just giving an overall uh, picture of uh, our missions, which we talk about here at the Christian Church as our kingdom commitment, our investment with missions. Now, our theological strategy for our mission comes to us from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus tells his disciples that uh, this strategy, he says he's going, that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they'll be his witnesses, telling people about him everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Now, of course, that's not just a promise for the disciples, but also it's a strategy for us. And so in that strategy, we see that Jesus gives us three fronts for our missions, for our mission strategy. And to understand those, to understand the, the place where the disciples, where Jesus gave this strategy to them, where they were in Israel, and actually they were in Jerusalem. So the first mission field, or the first front there, is he said that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem is their local mission field. And the next one was in throughout Judea and Samaria, which is the nation. And so that's the national missions front. 
And the last one, he said, is that they'll also be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And of course, that is our international missions plan. So at the Christian Church of Estes Park, we have that same three-prong missions focus strategy. We want to be uh, ministering in missions outreach locally, nationally, and internationally. In the upcoming weeks, we're going to talk about each one of those areas, the missions partners that we support in this. But I also want to talk about how missions are funded here at the Christian Church of Estes Park. And so what we have is at our church, there are two different funds or two different budgets that run. The first one is our general operational budget, which comes from the tithes and our general offerings. And those funds go into uh, to support and fund the mission work or the ministry work here at the Christian Church of Estes Park and the ministry work through our church as well. In addition to that, we have a totally separate uh, mich- uh, budget, which is our missions budget, and that's funded through our Kingdom Commitment offerings, and those go directly to our ministry missions partners throughout the world. And since this is Missions Month, let's talk about (laughs) those missions budgets and those ministry partners. How is that developed? Well, here we at the Christian Church of Estes Park, what we take is the previous year's kingdom commitment offerings, all of those that are made towards that missions budget, and we save those up, and the total that we receive for that previous year becomes our next year's missions budget. So give an uh, example of what that looks like. In uh, 2019 we began saving all of the Kingdom Commitment offerings that came in. And then, once that uh, fiscal year had ended, we transferred those funds over to our 2020 missions budget. So 100% of the offerings that came in for Kingdom Commitment are now part of the missions budget. The missions team then meets and distributes, figures out how we're going to distribute those funds, and throughout the year sends those to our missions partners. Meanwhile, in 2020 then, all of the kingdom commitments that came in in 2020 are being saved. And that's what we are doing right now. And uh, that'll become our next year's missions budget. And so our 2020 missions budget then uh, it has a fiscal year. It doesn't start January through December, but actually goes from June through May. So our 2020 missions budget will start June 2020 and will end May 2021. So it's... Uh, begins at the next month. And so uh, the Kingdom Commitment offerings through the end of this month, through May, actually go into our 2020 missions budget. They go to our 2020 missions partners, which will begin uh, next month. And so last year in 2019, uh, we had a missions budget of just a little over $28,000 and through the generosity of our church. And that's Wonderful. So far, in uh, we have raised six thousand dollars towards our 2020 budget. So obviously, it's a little bit of a decrease from the year before, and so uh, we're hoping to make that up. But whatever we have less, we will have to make some difficult uh, decisions as to how to back off our mission support for that next year. Um, or who knows? Could be a great month, and uh, in which case, then we would then increase the amount of missions that we support for that next year. And so uh, how do you invest in our kingdom commitment? Well, there are a couple easy ways. The first one is online. Uh, You can go to our uh, website at funchurch.com forward slash give or just go to funchurch.com and look for that red button give. And then when you select that and you give online, make sure that you select the drop down tab. It's set to tithe and offerings. Make sure you select missions. And 100% of the donations that you give to those will be set aside for our next year's budget, and then will be given to our missions partners uh, that way. Or uh, you can also mail donations here to our church, Christian Church of Estes Park in 4655 U.S. Highway 36 in Estes Park, Colorado. And uh, please don't mail cash, but if you mail a check, uh, make sure you put missions in the memo line. And so we will make sure that we allocate those funds for our missions budget. And so that's uh, just kind of a rundown of our theological and financial strategy, support missions, our investment in the kingdom commitment here at the church. Next week, we're going to talk about actually our local missions ministry partners, where those funds go to, and look forward to uh, sharing that with you then.
as we do go into a time of prayer this morning, uh, let's uh, think about our missionaries around the world, around the nation, and around this community that we support. And uh, let's lift them up uh, this morning. As well as uh, any prayer requests or praises or thanksgivings that you have, feel free to take a moment at home, pray for those things. And if there's anything that you um, want to share with the uh, congregation, with our church, feel free to type that in the comments and we'll uh, pray together this morning. Um, and we'll pray for each other as we see those pop up. So let's do that. Uh, let's prepare our hearts for prayer and, and let's pray a little bit and then we're going to pray about a, a few things specifically together. God, as we continue into responsive prayer time, uh, Lord, we want to pray for those around us that we know who don't know you, and we're going to lift them up this morning. Let's do that now. God, we're also going to lift up those um, we know who are going through difficult times, uh, struggles right now. Um, many of us probably know many people who are, and so we're going to lift them up to you. Let's do that now. God, we're also going to lift up uh, land and a building to you. Uh, Lord, you've given us a vision to move in town, and we um, want to be uh, faithful and, and uh, uh, to you and, and keep asking you for that right spot. And God, we know you have it for us. And so we're going to take uh, just a few moments and um, ask you for that uh, location, that right location that you have for us in town. God, we're going to pray for our community uh, during this time. We're going to pray for our businesses who are um, experiencing struggles right now as everything's been shut down. And uh, we're going to pray for our business owners in our church. Uh, we're going to pray uh, for uh, many businesses around town and for our governments as well to make um, uh, just the wise and good choices as we are experiencing uh, life a little differently right now. Let's lift these things up now.
hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Stuff is happening. People are getting sick. But can we say all our hope is in you? All our strength is in you, God. All our peace and all our life. Let's give our life to him this morning. Let's sing it out. Oh, my hope is in you. Oh.
we're going to take communion now as a church family. And um, like we said at the beginning of the service, if you have a cracker of bread and, and some juice, feel free to grab that now. And we're just going to take a few moments here and um, just thank God for what he's done for us. And as we do, feel free to grab those things so we can take communion together this morning. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, it says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take this together this morning. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Let's drink it together this morning. God, we praise you uh, for your love for us, the sacrifice that you um, gave, the sacrifice that you did on that cross. Um, God, you bore our sin, and uh, we know that we have hope of eternity in you. God, may you um, be in the rest of the service, open our hearts and our ears to, to hear what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome back to the Christian Church of Estes Park as we continue our series on living hope that we began way back in Easter. And uh, I'll tell you what, this week we have crossed a massive milestone. This is over 40 days in our uh, stay-at-home order and isolation. And Bible 40 is a pretty important number. You remember the 40 days in the wilderness or the 40 days of rain in Noah's time. Uh, Jesus, uh, well, he would have that 40 days of of temptation, and for us, 40 days at home. And so, uh, well done, we have that. And as we slowly begin from going from the stay-at-home order to the safer at home and begin slowly uh, reintegrating uh, with these uh, our society and starting things back up, we want to continue praying uh, for our neighbors and our families, our friends, and, and our community as we begin uh, coming back together. And I cannot wait until we have folks we can begin doing worship services together again. So we're continuing working on that and praying about it. But today, as we continue on that living hope, as we cross that 40-day part, we're going to be talking about uh, how do we have living hope in the face of failure? Because I know over the past 40 days, a lot of difficult things have happened. Uh, the last uh, 40 days have not been kind to a lot of our plans and so uh, many of our church members so we know have lost their jobs or have had uh, uh, their income curtailed quite a bit, and that's been really difficult. And uh, uh, I, lots of ideas or plans as to what we wanted to do as to uh, what we're going to do for 2020. It definitely have changed kind of on a <laughs> at just a moment. It was really amazing how all this hit. And so... Uh, when life changes, when, when our plans don't come to fruition, when we face failures, it can be a pretty difficult thing. And so today we're going to be talking about how do we handle that? How do we face failures in such a way that uh, it leads us to a living hope? And how does that living hope carry us through those failures? Now, the memory verse that we have for this series reminds us of one of those ways that uh, reminds us of the hope that we have in Christ, even in the midst of our failures. Romans 8.18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And so this passage, again, reminding us that today is not forever. And ultimately, aren't you grateful that it doesn't just rest on our shoulders that Jesus won the victory? 
<laughs> and that, you know, what, what is coming next, uh, we're part of the great victory uh, in Christ as he returns. All that's settled. So what's coming next, our present sufferings, the difficult things we go through in life, don't even compare. And that right there gives us some living hope to face even difficult things and even failures in our life today. So with that in mind, uh, let's just say it a few times. Let's remind ourselves of this wonderful truth from God's Word, and then we'll get into the message. So here we go. Say it along with me. Three, two, one. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, Romans 8, 18. All right, again, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, Romans 8, 18. And one more time, just to make sure that it's imprinted and impressed upon our hearts. Here we go. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Wonderful. Take some time this week and remind yourself of that. Uh, maybe it's something every single day as we go through this, as I have been. And Aaron, this is tough. It's really hard for me not to be with you. But I know that today is not forever, and what God is doing is far greater than today. So a good thing. Now, today's message is, I think, applicable for everybody because everybody that I know, and I think everybody in the world, um, faces failure. At some point in life, uh, we all face times when things just don't happen the way that we wished they would, or maybe we messed up, and, uh, but however it happened, the world didn't operate according to our plans. We face that kind of failure. I mean, rarely in life do, does anybody succeed on the first try. Right? Rarely. Uh, you know, and there is such thing as beginner's luck, people say, but most times it takes several tries uh, and sometimes many, many hundreds or thousands to be, have mastery over something. And so whether it's work or school or relationships or even faith, uh, we all come to these points in life where we just fail. And failure is frustrating, it's disappointing, and can really wound us, but also it's an opportunity. Uh, failure is an opportunity to either give up or to grow up. And uh, we really want to talk about it. How do we grow through our failures? One of my favorite authors is a guy named Randy Alcorn. He wrote uh, this great quote. I, I used it a few years back in one of my messages as well. He says, a faith that cannot be shaken is a faith that has been shaken. And just think about that for a second. If you have a faith that can't be shaken, it means that it already has been, we've already gone through, and we recognize that as I face trials, those trials can actually make me stronger, and it's just that way. What a truth that is. And failure is one of those times that a lot of times we are shaken to our core. And so growing through failure prepares us for what God has in store for us in the future. And that really is the core of what we're talking about today. And so with that in mind, would you open up your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 21. And so let me give you just a quick recap of where we are in John, chapter 21. And the sto today's story really centers around uh, the disciple, Peter. And Peter uh, was a quick-tempered fisherman, right? He had a, a way of putting his foot in his mouth and, and things like that. But uh, we all love Peter. He, he just went 100% into stuff. And he left everything to follow Jesus, right? Uh, once he was introduced to Jesus, he had a little bit of time where he got to listen to Jesus, and then Jesus called him and said, hey, Peter, you are a fisher of fish. Come follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. And Peter left everything. This big, bold guy left his employment and followed Jesus, which was great. Well, things were going really good. John 13, uh, Jesus makes a prediction of betrayal. Right, so this is much later, near the end of Jesus' ministry, and uh, Jesus says, "One of you all are going to betray me." And uh, at that time, as they're sitting at the table, uh, Judas gets up and he leaves and he goes betrays Jesus. But none of the disciples knew that. Peter, there, was sitting at the table, and when Jesus said, "One of you going to betray me," Peter says, "I'm not going to betray you. I will never betray you. In fact, I will die before I would ever betray you." And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, well, uh, Peter, actually, before tomorrow morning, before the rooster crows tomorrow, you're going to have betrayed me three times. And so then in John chapter 18, that's uh, Good Friday, he, we see how after the 
the dinner that Jesus had. He prays for disciples. They go to the Mount of Olives and in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is there, and he tells Peter, hey, uh, Peter, John, James, they're there, and he says, pray with me. And Peter falls asleep. He's not even able to keep his eyes open. He's not able to pray with Jesus, and Jesus is there praying so hard. He's uh, sweat of, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, sweating blood, and it was, you know, really distressed, and Peter wasn't able to stay awake. And then Jesus comes to him and says, hey, uh, my, de- my betrayer is here, and sure enough, there comes Judas. Judas comes and kisses Jesus on the cheek and betrays him, and, and Peter draws his sword, and he's going to defend his master. He's going to keep good to his word where he says, you know what, uh, I will uh, stand with you to the end. And so he slices off the high priest's servant's ear and Jesus tells Peter to put away his sword and, and he, Jesus heals the high servant's ear. And, and after that, we see Peter, he follows Jesus. You know, he ran away because um, the, 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 the crowd there was going to arrest Peter and the disciples as well. So they escaped. Then Peter goes and he follows behind and then he sneaks into the courtyard of the high priest. And while he's there, uh, he's recognized by a servant girl, and the servant girl says, hey, you're with Jesus. And he says, no, I'm not. And then later on, she says, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're, you're with Jesus. And he says, I swear, I'm, I'm not with him. And so he leaves and goes to a different place, and while he was there, some other service looked at him and said, no, we're pretty positive. You were with Jesus. And he says, I, I, he called curses down upon himself. He says, I'll be cursed if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And then, of course, the rooster crowed. And... Peter recognized that Jesus was right. Before the rooster code, he, he denied his master three times. He denied his friend three times. He denied his Savior three times. And so he says he left, he wept, and he left um, knowing that he, he had failed. And, and so what does Peter do? Well, he stays with the apostles. Jesus, the next couple days, Jesus raises again from the dead and and all of that, and Peter's one of the first to go look and all that, which is all very exciting. He sees the risen Lord, but there's something about him that he just didn't really ever overcome that failure yet. And so really we find him going back to the family business. I'm sure he's so glad that Jesus was alive, but he's like, I missed out on being a fisher of men. So he goes back to being a fisher of fish. And that's kind of where we find him in, in John 21. It's after the resurrection, and Jesus told them, Hey, listen, I want you to meet me in Galilee. And so this is where we pick up the, the story, uh, starting in verse 1 of uh, chapter 21. And it says this, Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Gal- Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And then he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Well, when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off. And he jumped into the water. Well, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, uh, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Well, none of the disciples dared ask them, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. 
This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Now, that is a story of a redemption past failure. And something in that passage which is harder for us to understand in the English language and at the end part that uh, we kind of miss is Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And, and, Jesus, and Peter says, yes, but... The words that Jesus used and Peter were used actually are not really, um, you can't quite tell in the English what they're saying. When Jesus asked Peter the first two times, he says, do you love me? He uses a word for love that we know as agape, right? It's the kind of love that is, uh, it is unconditional. It's, uh, and he asked Peter, do you love me? Do you unconditionally love me? Will you follow me no matter what? And that was really hard for Peter because it brought up his failure. Because he knew that he denied the Lord. He chose himself and he, he, he wimped out. And he denied his best friend and his Lord uh, the night that Jesus was betrayed. And so Peter couldn't bring himself honestly to answer Jesus. I love you. He said, Lord, you know everything. You remember my failure, Lord. <laughs> and so he said, instead of agape, he said, Lord, I phileo. I love you like a brother. And so Jesus asks him the first time, do you agape me? And Peter said, well, actually, I phileo you. And then Jesus asks again, do you agape me? And Peter says, no, I phileo you. I, I love you like a brother. And so the third time when Jesus asks, he doesn't use agape. He says, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? And that's why it says Peter was hurt. Because the third time Jesus says, you know, do you love me? <laughs> he said, do you love me like a brother? Do you phileo love me? And that, I think, really goes to the heart of where John, Peter, at that point, was still feeling like he could not overcome his failures. And yet through that, we see a promise and a redemption that Christ brings at the end of that passage, which we'll get to here at the end of the message. As we go there, though, I'm going to talk about four ways that this scripture really teaches us to face failure with living hope. And the first thing that we can do is we need to face the emotions of my failure. Failure leads to powerful emotions, right? Uh, I, I'm a football coach, and I love doing that. And uh, there's the thrill of victory, but there's also the pain of defeat. <laughs> Uh, and when y you lose or something goes bad, it's hard, man. A, a locker room after a loss is, is rough and even worse is a bus ride afterwards, right? There's powerful emotions, but that's just a game. Um, Peter failed Jesus and the most important thing is the, the God of the universe showed up, became his best friend, and he betrayed him. And not just once, he betrayed him three times. And he had a strong reaction. His own personal failing not only led him to, to weep and to cry and to leave the, the high priest's place, but then even after Jesus was raised again, he couldn't bring himself to say, Lord, you know that I love you unconditionally. I, I love you with agape love. He just couldn't do that. He had this scar of failure within him. 
And so Peter gave up. I mean, his first reaction, he didn't give up on the Lord. He still loved him like a brother. He still knew he was Lord. He just didn't believe that God could use him. And so he didn't believe he could be a fisher of men anymore. And so he went back to being a fisher of fish. I mean, have you ever faced failure? Can you relate to what I'm saying? Have you ever had a time in your life where you failed, you've done something and you feel like, well, I know there's grace and I know that people will care for me, but I just don't feel like I, I can't trust me anymore. You know, I give up. Well, that's what failure does sometimes, is it can make us want to quit. It makes us want to, uh, to say, well, I'm not good enough. I failed the test, and so I, I'm going to have to find something less good for me to be able to do. And I think the more we identify with whatever it is that we failed in, the stronger the urge to quit, right? And so, uh, for example, there's been a study a few years back that, that looked at uh, men and women and how we face failures and what were the st- hardest failures for you know, men to deal with and what were the hardest failures for women to deal with. And unsurprisingly, they were a little different, but, but they have this one thing in common, the thing that men, uh, the hardest failures for men to overcome, personal failings, had to do with career. When men failed in their career, it, it cut them deeply to the very core of their person because they identify very deeply that way. With women, the failures that they had the hardest time overcoming were with relationships, where if they had a friendship that went sour or a marriage that went sour or a relationship with a child that wasn't good, uh, they felt they failed in. For women, that was the hardest thing to overcome. But for both, it was what they identified most closely with is what they uh, had the hardest time overcoming. If they had, and that is the same thing with all failures. When we face something, we fail in something that really matters to us, it cuts deep. And Peter identified pretty closely with Jesus. Remember, he left everything, his family business, his family, right? All the comforts of all the life and all that, he, to follow Jesus. And then he, f- he failed, and he failed hard. And so he had difficult emotions. And the first thing we recognize is that uh, we, we need to make sure that we are honest with ourselves when we fail, that it's going to hurt. It stings. And so two keys for not getting stuck in that failure to feel like I I'm not going to stay and identify myself as a failure in this. Is the first thing you need to do is to find some good support. When Peter was around the disciples, which you think about, uh, probably a pretty good group of guys, right? <laughs> a good group of friends that were pointing the right things. And when we are uh, in the midst of failure, to help us to not just get stuck in that negative self-talk that just tells us, and the enemy's always there too to tell you, they call the accuser of the brethren, always going to be there just telling you, you're a loser, right? When we fail, how do we not get stuck? First thing, we have some good friends around us, godly friends. So don't just, you know, stroke our egos, but help draw us up and remind us of the truth that we need to have godly, encouraging friends, which is why church is so important. And that's why we need one another. The second thing that we have on top of that, though, is we need to go to Jesus. Now, we need to have good support, but we also need to go to Jesus. Why? Well, we need grace. And this world doesn't understand grace. We didn't get what grace was until, really, we understood what God gave to us. We don't earn it. It's given to us. And we see Peter coming to Jesus in this, right? Jesus cooks the meal, right, all that, and then he goes and has a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus will gifts him with an amazing amount of grace, an amazing amount of mercy, and gives him the power to be redeemed. And one of the things that we have in the Christian life, which is so amazing, is this thing called new life, that we take our failures to God uh, and all the, the brokenness that we have, and we hand it to him, and God gives us new purpose, new life beyond it. But we don't identify with those dead things any longer. And so we have those two things, that we need to have good support, we need to go to Jesus that helps us address the emotional difficulty of failing. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, that we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see, That's why we can go to Jesus, is he understands. He understands us because he's been in this world and he understands the brokenness of this world. And Jesus loves you so much. And so our God is not the one who sits up in the the clouds looking down and saying, I can't believe these humans, how they keep failing. Jesus understands our weakness. 
And he says, come to me with it. And he allows us to begin that process of saying, to handing over to him and grieving the failure, the emotion. Once we've done that, the second thing that we do is we need to allow my failures to draw me close to God. Right? Failure uh, doesn't need to separate us from God. It used to in the past. Right? Sin is failure. It's a moral failing. And so as a, when we sin, we are separated from God and all of this. But then Jesus came and he bridged that gap for us. And he overcame our greatest failing, which was denying God. Right? That's the biggest failure any of us could ever do is to deny our, our creator, to separate ourselves from God. And Jesus overcame that. Well, he overcomes all of the other smaller failures that we, we commit as well. And so failure doesn't have to separate us from God. See, God is not disappointed in us. We have to understand that and, and really get that. That when you fail, it's not as though it took God by surprise. Like he was like, wow, I totally thought he would get it this time. I mean, God knows all things. He knew before the beginning of the world everything that you would do. And he knew your name, he knew your life, and he knows what comes next. And he still chose you. He still made you and still came to offer you grace. And so when we fail, it's not as though, like, before I fail, then God was like, oh, you're so great. And then once I fail, he's like, well, I can't believe you did that. I mean, is that how we see God treat uh, Peter? Of course not. Before Peter failed, Jesus said, "Uh, I've got a betrayer, and and, uh, Peter's like, not me. (laughs) I'll die with you. And Jesus says, well, actually, you're going to also deny me three times before tomorrow. And Jesus didn't say, so get out of here. No. Jesus knew, and he loved Peter before he failed, and he loved him after he failed. And the God is the same way with us. He's not disappointed with us. He's not discouraged. God is not like, well, I can't do anything with them. God can, can reconcile us back to him, and he can redeem any brokenness. But we have to bring it to him. So allow our brokenness to go bring us back to God. I think of it this way. Uh, for those of you who are parents out there, you'll remember what it's like when your children learn to walk. And for those of you who don't have kids, maybe there was a time that you were a child and you learned to walk. And uh, think about this. like When you took your first steps, so when a baby takes the first steps, the parents are ecstatic, right? They're like, wow, my kid walked, right? And they're all proud, and they, now they put it on their iPhone, and they'll put it on social media and all this kind of stuff. Well, typically when a kid learns to walk, it's not like they take their first step and the next thing they're going to do is going to you know, run a marathon. It's like they take their first step and then they're like, and it's not even a pretty step. It's like, it's like a lousy step. It's like, and then they, they take one. And even though it's not the great step, it's a step. And the parents are so proud. And then maybe the second step, the kid falls down. And it's not like the parents are like, oh, I thought you could do better, right? That's not how it is. And when a child learns to walk, they'll take a step and then they'll fall down. And the parents are proud and they step the kid back up again and maybe they'll take two or three steps and they're, they're super proud of them, right? It is the same way for us as we learn to walk in this new life in Christ, as we grow up, as we're, we're born again and, and brought up as believers and mature, that we're going we're gonna to fall a lot. In fact, when we first start in our walk in Christ, we fall a lot more than we, <laughs> than we actually take steps. And God is not upset about that. In fact, we think of them as failures, but they're just part of the process of growing. And so Peter was in this process. He was growing, but there was, he wasn't there. He was maturing. And he wanted in his heart to be honest and right with God, and then he messed up and he fell. And with that, his failure pushed him from God, didn't it? Like the first thing he did is he ran away and then, and, and he couldn't even bring himself to say, Jesus, you know, I love you unconditionally. He couldn't say that. And so he had this thing where he had this tension that he felt ashamed of himself. And he also felt this love that was trying to draw him back to God. I think a lot of times, as those of us that are Christians, we have that. We, we fail and we feel bad and we feel shame. We also love God and we, we want to be reconciled with him so badly, but we just don't feel that we're worthy. And that's the point of grace. This will never be worthy. But God makes us worthy. It, pressure in this world, in this life, it's, it's going to either push us to God or it's going to push us away from God, right? That's what pressure does, is it moves us. And I'll say when we fail and we deal with the emotions and we recognize that this hurts, it stings because 
you know, I let myself down or the world let me down or my plans didn't come through. We deal with the emotions, but we don't own them. We don't say, I'm awful because I did this. I did something that was awful. (laughs) But God can change me and God can reconcile this. Then we bring that to God. We can choose to come to him in it. Or we can choose to run from God, right? And so uh, Peter, at first, he kind of gave up on his calling, but he didn't give up on his faith. Look at Judas on the other half, you know. Uh, Judas betrayed Jesus, right? Just like Peter did. He betrayed him, but he had never come back to God. He, He stayed far from God and ended up committing suicide in the midst of his guilt and his shame. Only if he would have come. But Jesus, uh, even when we give up on ourselves, God doesn't give up on us. And God's grace is more than enough. So in our failings, can we move back to God? In verse 7 of that passage uh, that we read, John 17, uh, actually John 21, it says that uh, John recognized that it was Jesus, right? Like we, we see uh, there on the boat and Peter and the rest of the disciples, they go out to fish, and they can't even catch any fish. He's like, man, I can't be a fisherman, and I can't even catch fish, right? And there's this guy on the shore. He's asking them, hey, have you got any fish? He's like, thanks for pointing that out. No, I don't have any fish, right? And so then Jesus does the miracle, and they have so many fish, they can't pull them in. And John is the first one to recognize him. He's like, wow, it's Jesus. But John, even though he recognized it was the Lord, wasn't the one who jumped into the water. That was Peter. Even though he felt so unworthy, he couldn't bring himself to tell Jesus, I love you unconditionally. He was the disciple who jumped in, who swam to shore and says, forget the fish. I want, I want to be with my Lord. See, a lot of times in failure, people run from God. And they do that because they feel guilt and they feel shame and all of those things. But we have a high priest that understands us. He understands our brokenness. And he says, come. Bring your brokenness, bring your shame, bring your guilt, bring all of that, bring it to me. Because God is big enough to handle it. And he took the guilt to the cross and he executed the shame and he can redeem even our worst failings. So the question we have to ask ourselves is which way are we running? When we fail, when we make a mistake, maybe even during these 40 days, maybe it hasn't been a financial failing, maybe it's been a relational failing. Maybe it's been a, a, a moral failing where you've been trying to step away from an addiction or, or a, a bad habits or something like this, and then you find yourself cloistered at home with all of these stresses and you've just d- given back in to this old, old sinful thing that you swore off. Well, can you take it to Jesus? Can you take it to him now? He'll hear you. He'll accept you, and his grace is enough. The third thing that we do as we take our failings to Jesus is that we need to learn uh, what, what's the, the source of my failure, right? We want to learn from it. Again, failures are opportunities to either grow up or, or to give up. And if we don't learn from something, we're going to have the same failing over and over and over again. Like that very famous saying, what's the uh, definition of, of uh, mental or insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Well, If we failed, it helps us to figure out why. What did we do wrong? It doesn't make us bad people that we didn't get it perfect. It means that we did something that we could fix. So we need to learn from failure. That's the key to redeeming it, right? To learn from what we did, we need to identify its root. Where was the root of it? Did Peter learn from his failing? (laughs) Verse 15 in that. In that passage there. John 21, verse 15. Where uh, Peter says, uh, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you agape love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. <laughs> I mean, you could see in that that, that the conversation after breakfast was uh, Jesus was having this, this say, hey, Peter, um, I want to know that, that you love me. I want you to know that you love me. And uh, Peter was like, wow, um, I can't bring myself to do it. I know that I failed in this. But even in so doing, it shows that he understood what he did wrong. See, failure was that test. He had to learn what he did wrong. What did Peter do wrong? What was the root of his sin? What was the root of his failure? It was pride. Peter thought way too much of his ability and his faithfulness beforehand, right? So in John uh, 13, what we find that Jesus says, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And, and Peter says, I will never betray you. I'll even die for you. What did he have? He pride. 
He thought way too highly of himself and his abilities. And so when Jesus comes back and asks him, hey, Peter, can you love me with agape love? Peter's like, whoa, I no longer think of myself the way that I used to. Maybe. And that pride went away. I think for us that we need to, to pass the test is we need to discover why it is we fail. So if it was a financial failing, learn from it. It doesn't make you a bad person that things didn't go right, but learn from it. If you, had, if you paid the tuition, get the education, right? If it's a relational failing, if you had a, a fight with your spouse or with your kids or a falling out with a friend, think about it. Spend some time taking it apart. Figure out what broke down and where in me is there anything that I could have done to have changed the outcome. Learn from it. And as we do that, the fourth thing we need to do is that we need to listen and obey God's new plan for us, right, for you. To say, God, what is it that you have for me? As we take our failures to God, and as we break them down, and we figure out, okay, here's the things that, that stop, then we take that to God, and then we say, okay, Lord, I'm bringing this to you, but, I, uh, but to know that God does not define us by our past. He defines us by our future in Him, right? So this is why in Christ... It says that we are called the, the holy ones of God. We're saints. That's the word in Scripture. It uses the same word, saint. Anybody who's a follower of Jesus, he calls us saints. And I know lots of Christians, including myself, and I don't always act like a saint. But God sees me as a saint, and he calls me a saint. Why? Because that's who he's making me into. He sees the potential of who we are. It's like when you go this time of year, we go to the store, we buy packets of seeds. I guess we're in Colorado and we can do that, right? We buy packets of seeds and you might buy your, uh, you know, your sweet peas or something like that. And you see the seeds there, the sweet pea seeds. Well, you don't look at that sweet pea seed and say, well, it's only a seed, right? You look at that and you plant it, but you know what it can be. And so you treat it like it, what it can be. You plant it in the ground so it's going to have some room for it to grow. And you give it the sunlight that a pea uh, plant might need. So that way, uh, you treat it like you know what it's becoming. Can you imagine how silly it would be if you just treated seeds only like seeds? They would stay in a packet forever. God knows what we're becoming, and he treats us according to who we are. And so I think part of it, when we fail, we uh, diagnose what it is that we went through, what broke down, but then we also go to God, and we allow him to cast that new vision for us. We're not defined by our past. We're defined by him. And so we give God this, uh, God exchanges our, <laughs> our old plans, our old brokenness, our old failures with new purpose. That's what he does. There's a, a real good, uh, a well-known uh, speaker, Zig Ziglar, wrote some business books and things like this, and he always has these pithy sayings. And one thing that he wrote, years ago I heard this, and it's always stuck with me. He said, failure is a detour, not a dead end. <laughs> and so let's not make it a dead end. It, it's not a dead end when we bring our failures to God and we listen to how he says he's going to use them. Proverbs 24 says this, uh, Though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. See, part of wisdom, part of being in Christ is to recognize that when we fail, yeah, we might fall down seven times. There are times that we're just not going to get it. But if we bring our failures to God, He gives us a new life and we don't give up. We don't give up on ourselves because God has not given up on us. So Peter failed, but Jesus restored him, didn't He? Jesus said, hey, <laughs> Peter, do you love me? And Jesus uh, was denied three times by Peter, and so he gives Peter three times to, to also affirm his love. And so, what do we see? Peter is affirmed again into his position. He, becomes, he was a denier of the Lord, but he was known now, when you talk about Peter, he's known as a leader of the early church, a man of great faith. And Peter was actually even the spokesman at Pentecost, which think how cool that was. And Peter penned uh, two great books of Scripture. Uh, plus, he was the, uh, Mark was his disciple, so the Gospel of Mark was really Peter's experience. Peter fed Jesus' sheep. He was faithful. He, Jesus gave him a new purpose. He said, Peter, you were denied, but no longer. You are mine. You love me? Good. You can love me like a brother. That's enough. Uh, but feed my sheep. Do my work. See, failure doesn't keep us from being used by God. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I think about uh, many times in our life, it's not in spite of our failures that we're good at something. Sometimes it's even because of them. We learn a deep and a profound lesson. 
And when we fail, we're like, oh, I'm never going to do that again. And because we learn that lesson and really own it, it changes us and makes us set for success. A good example is this. Um, Joshua was a, a mighty warrior in Israel. At the early time of, he was uh, Moses' right-hand man. He leads the people of Israel into the promised land on the conquest. And as he goes in, he, uh, he starts fighting. He has his first real loss, right? Uh, things didn't go perfect. And he has this loss in the conquest. And he feels ashamed in the press because, you know, Moses, everything seemed to go really great with Moses. And here he is trying to lead the people in this new land and all this. And he has this, this loss. And he takes it very personal because he's a commander. And he's humiliated. And in the midst of that failure, in the midst of that where he felt like he just let everybody down with really huge consequence, uh, Joshua 7.10, we find this uh, really interesting and I think encouraging message from the Lord. It says this. It says, The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. Why have you fallen on your face? I love that. Uh, right after, I mean, just in the midst of, of the brokenness of the failure, Joshua's like given up. He's just fallen on his face. He's like, I can't do this. Clearly, I'm not the leader that Moses or even God thought I was. <laughs> and God says, get up. Get up. I'm not done with you. And then he says, here's why you failed. And here's how I want you to fix it. Well, I'll say this, that God does the same thing for us. If you failed or you're failing right now or you're going to face failure, listen to God. Bring it to him. Ask him for wisdom and encouragement right, and discernment as you figure out what went wrong, but then get up. If you're still breathing, so just check yourself right now. (sighs) Still breathing? Good. God's not done with you. God is something He's doing in your life. He's working through you. He's called you to something more than just failure. So if you're struggling with failure right now, bring it to Him. Bring it to Him and let Him redeem it and trust Him to do so because our God is powerful. Back to Peter's story. Yeah, Jesus said to him, hey, do you agape me, remember? Peter was like, no, nah, I, uh, I phileo you, right? I love you like a brother. I don't love you unconditional. And that third time, Jesus says, okay, can you love me like a brother? And Peter's heart was, hard, was sad, right? He was just broken because he was like, man, even God was like, gets it, that I can't love him unconditionally. He'll still use me. Right? He still tells me to, to feed in my sheep, even if, if it's only brotherly love. But it, that still would have stung. Be like, okay, it kind of confirmed to him that maybe he didn't love him. But then Jesus goes on. Jesus goes on and he finishes up that, uh, that last part of that passage. It says uh, in verse uh, let's see, 17 and, and 18, where it says, uh, verse 18, after Jesus says, okay, you can still phileo me. Feed my sheep. But then he says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. And then verse 19 explains what that means. Is Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now, not many of us would take that on as like, hey, that's a great thing, right? That uh, Jesus tells Peter, actually, you're going to agape love me. You actually do. And he tells Peter this, like, yeah, you, you failed me in the past. Right? You, you got your own clothes on, you did things, that was in the past. But in the future, I want you to know that there's a time where you're not going to deny me. And you're going to die for me. And that was the thing that Peter, that was the test that Peter failed. And Jesus says, I'm giving you another chance. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, spoiler alert at the end, you pass. You pass. See, our God is the God of redemption. Right? He is the God who can take our broken lives and put them back together. He could take our failings and make them not only our strengths, but he is the God of not just second chances, but all new chances. So we got to bring our failures to God. So today, what about you? Are you experiencing failure? Is it your business going under? You lost your job? You have difficult times at home? Are you right? Uh, You have struggle with some sins or some old addictions or things like this that are just feel like you're just not making it. Well, this is what we need to do. And this is the great thing that you can have living hope to handle them. You need to face the emotions of your failure. It's okay to say, man, this hurts. But then take your failures, allow them to draw you closer to God in them. 
and then identify and learn the source of that failure. Figure out why is it I'm failing in this. And then listen and obey God's new plan for you. And then there is nothing in life that we come, no uh, amount of success and no amount of failure that can keep us from the good things that God has called us to. And we will emerge from this time and in all things in life as victors more than overcomers because of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, that brings this particular message to an end, but I'd say since we have God's Word, I'm going to challenge you to apply God's Word. Right? So things that maybe you can do this week, some next steps you can take based upon uh, what we, we've seen here in uh, this passage from the book of John. Why don't you start by memorizing Romans 8.18? In the midst of failure, when the enemy is there to tell you that you're awful and it doesn't get better, why don't you remind him and yourself that everything we go through in life doesn't compare with the glory that will be revealed to us in Christ Jesus. Why don't you take some time this week and memorize Romans 8.18? Something else you might want to do is I quoted just a short portion of that story from Joshua. Joshua, where he had that failing and and God tells him, hey, get up, get back in the battle and go fight again. And guess what? Uh, He does and uh, good things happen. Why don't you read that? If you want to see what it looks like to have a failing and then how God redeems it, it's going to be in Joshua chapter 7 through 9. Uh, Take some time this week and read that. Something else you can do, why don't I encourage you to pray? Why don't you take your failures to Christ, right? And why don't you commit to this week? Say, you know what? Instead of being ashamed of them and causing my shame to separate me from God, I'm going to go to God with my failing. The last thing, uh, the best thing that you can do, if you haven't done this yet, is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right? To take the biggest failing that you ever had, and that's sin that separates you from God, and to take that to God and, and let Jesus heal you. Accept him as your Lord it means you believe he's God and he uh, basically has a new life where you're going to follow it and your Savior. And you're going to allow him to redeem you, to become his disciple. If that's what you would like to do to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please let me know. This is not a sales pitch and this is not a, a short-term thing. It's not like a one-time decision and nothing changes. No, it's a whole new life and I want to help you understand what that is, help you take those steps of faith and faithfulness. You need to believe and repent and confess and be baptized and be discipled and become part of a church. So I'm going to encourage you uh, to, to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Well, let me help you with that. So this is what you can do is you can email me, uh, Aaron at funchurch.com, right? Uh, let us know. There's a link there on our website to contact us. Let me know you made the decision and I will help you take those next steps and start this new walk in Christ. Regardless of what commitments and next steps you're going to take, may God bless you this week as we continue walking out of this time of separation. Uh, May he redeem all of us for his good works. And until I see you next week, God bless. Sing, I have decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Cross I'll carry. My cross I'll carry until I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry. I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. me. No turning back. No turning back, no you go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have to 
decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning. No turning back. No turning. 